What does mission or being missional mean for us today? It's an important question and certainly the church throughout history has sought to answer this missiological question faithfully. But in this age of rapid change and uncertainty, it can often feel difficult to clarify and commit to the mission that God is inviting us to partake in. Perhaps we look to Google for help, but searching for missional church yields over two million hits. And what about books? We quickly realize that a mountain of content has been created just in the last couple decades. We've pondered and discussed mission a lot. But as we think about the context we find ourselves in right now, what we've been through the last few years, the changes in our communities and the consideration of the season ahead, we ask ourselves, what is mission today? What is God calling us to? With 2023 right around the corner, we're invited to place our hope once again in the Spirit of God to give us wisdom and examine our mission afresh, to perhaps simplify and re-engage the very heart of God for us. Perhaps a more timeless calling is needed to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Being missional then is simply committing ourselves to a life of humble, loving service, to be in the world, but not of it, to proclaim the gospel of the one who was sent into the world for the sake of others. We are both recipients and participants of the mission of God. We are connected to the world as a non-anxious presence, self-differentiated, but also full of compassion and hospitality. Our role is to listen, to pay attention, and to discern where God is at work, both locally and all around the world, joining in to witness the story of His redeeming power. Let me just tell you a few of the things that are happening here that uh, ways that we stay on mission as a deanery. We, we talk often as a deanery about our purpose as a deanery or, or values, you might say, being twofold. We want to collaborate and uh, be colleagues. So collaboration and collegiality are like our two values as a deanery. And a lot of what we collaborate on is ways that we can either do mission or worship together, come together and do something jointly every now and then. I'm a Christian because the church was on mission. I wasn't ever going to go to a church. Uh, I never was in a church building until I was in high school. And so the church reached out to me and found me, Christ found me through people going uh, and, and seeking after me. And so I think that's a, always been an important thing for me to make sure that the church, we are not being passive, but we're actively engaged in the work of missions. There's been an opportunity for us to kind of recalibrate and say, like, what is mission for us? What does this look like post-COVID? Uh, what is it like for our church and our individual ministries and our lives and our families? And, and for us at Redeemer, as well as myself personally, a lot of that has not, has not has, we've kind of gone away from all right what is kind of uh uh you know an exciting new ministry uh for us just to, to get behind and how can we kind of go back to the basics of what our call is as christ following believers what i've realized about myself is that the only gift i really have to give to anybody else is myself and so the starting point for me for staying on mission as a dean just as a pastor as a christian as a follower of jesus is to make sure that I am caring for my own soul. So the starting point for me is to just actually be with Jesus and try to become the kind of person who actually wakes up every day and says like, I'm, I'm with God. Good morning, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I think one of the ways we, we've um, kind of transitioned or one of the ways that we've tried to pivot and, and, and to engage in, effect, in effective ways is to just ask the question, what does it mean to be a healthy church? very simple. What does it mean to be a healthy church? Um, what does it mean to engage in our community in such a way that if people come to us, if they do life um, in the community of faith with, with us, what does it mean for them to experience healthy community and thereby themselves experience a healthier self? And that's what we've been focusing on. So I think right now, um, as we consider mission, that is our mission, to be as healthy a community as we can be so that we can invite people who are suffering in our community to experience that health in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the specific space of the body that we occupy. Thank you. 
To cultivate this imagination, we explore our response to Jesus' Great Commission. How do you hear Jesus? How might you respond to his call? One way women and men in C4SO are responding to the Great Commission is through the pursuit of holy orders. We ordain men and women who are aligned with C4SO's vision and values and bring their passions, gifts, and callings to share with our community. These ministers met the qualifications of planning a church that had reached critical mass or holding a paid position in a C4SO church that is thriving and growing. In addition to our new ordinands, we welcomed two clergy transfers from other dioceses. I see the role of being the canon for ordinations as a role where I need to help um, manifest, if you will, the insight, the wisdom, the discernment, and the direction that Bishop Todd has given all of us for how we do church in this strange cultural context. And mission as one of our values is uh, a primary thing that we look to. If you cannot draw a line between what I'm doing in that role and the mission that we have as a diocese, then something is broken. And when I say that, I mean that um, in mission, we really do believe that church planting is the number one way to spread the gospel. And we can see that all throughout the, the U.S. and what's happening in C4SO specifically. We got a call a long time ago to be a church planting diocese. So when I took on this role, we really did double down on church planting. And we focus strategically on the ordination path for not only church planters, but thriving C4SO churches that are going to plant more churches. And when we started this process, I was anticipating that God would show up. But let me tell you, God showed up. And over the course of the last several years, we are now ordaining 50% of our ordinance are church planters. And that's an incredible percentage difference. We have really uh, worked strategically to honor the role that they have. And you can look from Tampa to Raleigh to, to Texas and see our new ordinance planting churches and doing the really hard work. But not alone. They're surrounded by churches and people and uh, connected to clergy that support their call to do that, to spread the gospel through church planting. Because as you know, that mission is one of the hardest ones on planet Earth. I'm excited to be a, a part of that. Anything that I get to do is just watching God show off. And it's been a great time this year for just that reason. As we pursue the Great Commission, we do so by evangelism, church planning, and discipleship, which are core practices emerging from the New Testament. Church planning is at the heart of God's redemptive mission and crucial to His purposes. This year, we welcomed five church plants in different phases of the planning process. It's an exciting time for our diocese. I think you know in our bones we're a church planning movement. Todd has always been involved in church planting. Uh, I came under his leadership in the vineyard uh, as a church planter. I planted and been under his direction, really the, the scope of my whole life. And now it's a privilege for me to direct uh, all of our church planting for the diocese. There's so much good things going on. I guess I'll brag on our church planters first. Um, the, the church planters in our cohort in years two and three, just really proud of them for coming out of COVID getting back on mission, reorganizing, and really just digging in. And then we have some uh, year one and pre-launch folks that um, just the, the work of faith and courage and risk for the kingdom, it's inspiring. I think about in this last year, James and Happy have planted and launched public worship services. So have Travis and Mickey in Tampa, and really uh, astounded at the things that God's doing. And then we have some folks 
that are in pre-launch. The folks in Raleigh, North Carolina, that's Tanner and Kara, and um, they're hoping to begin to unpack and unfold their dreams for a church plant in the next six months. And then Nick and Ashley Nepper in Des Moines. We also have an emerging work in Waco and perhaps one in Omaha as well. So these are exciting times for us. And I think you would know as a diocese that there's different models of church planning and we're growing in all three. One would be just kind of that parachute drop. Somebody has a dream. That's the hardest one. It's not the one that we see the best future in. We're hoping to dream and create about residencies, daughter churches coming out of our existing churches. And then we're learning a little bit more about how interest groups can kind of contact us. And we have to develop this framework around inviting a rector to be a part of them. That's kind of a new model for us. And I guess when I think about uh, what you can do as a diocese is to, to pray. Uh, pray for our church plants. Pray for our, our diocese to be a church planting diocese. Pray for the ACNA. You know, if the ACNA is going to have any future in America, it's because uh, we think church planting has to be a vibrant part of that. New, vibrant, worshiping communities. So pray with us, dream with us, then begin to prepare your own churches for uh, dreaming up about planting daughter churches in, in existing neighborhoods around your cities. And then begin to restructure your finances so that you're really pouring resources and are ready to do that. So we go into 2023 with real dreams, hopes, visions, and we're excited to see what God is going to do and how we can all partner together in that work. Grace and peace to you. In addition to planning five churches, C4SO is in the process of adopting Grace Church Seattle in 2022. Through the process of church adoption, we help establish churches like Grace in other denominations or spaces discern whether C4SO would be a good home for them. Our adopted churches align with C4SO's five values and have a proven track record of effective ministry in the kingdom. Hey everybody, my name is Chris McDaniel and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am a pastor in Atlanta at a church called Trinity, and we just had our 20th birthday, actually. I also serve our diocese as the canon for church development. And that's just a fancy way of saying I get the privilege of walking alongside our Bishop Todd, the leadership team of C4SO as we dream and we architect and we imagine what God's going to do in the future in our diocese. But I also enjoy the privilege of coaching church planters and walking alongside pastors who are discerning whether they would join our diocese. Y'all, it's kind of a privileged space to sit in because I speak to pastors all the time. I actually just got off the phone with a pastor in another state who leads a church, is craving something older, something um, that's alive in mission, but also tethered to the historic church. And he just called me up and said, what would it look like for my church to discern whether we would want to become Anglican and join C4SO. And what I hear over and over again is that people are craving support in mission. They're also craving connection to something older than them, something older than maybe the Declaration of, the, of Independence. They just want to belong to something that is robust and historic. And I just think we hold that space right now and we don't hold it alone. There are so many faithful people doing great things, but I am so thankful for the fact that C4SO continues to be a space that people are drawn to. Um, and these conversations that I'm having, um, most of the time, it yields a church joyfully joining our tradition. I mean, I'm just thinking about last year's convention and some of the churches that came in and now they're joyfully contributing to our culture in C4SO. Y'all, God's up to some really good stuff. I'm so thankful to be serving our diocese and I'm thankful to be serving under our Bishop Todd and really hopeful for the future. God bless you. Thanks for letting me give an update. C4SO also obeys the sending in the Great Commission by going to people around the world. In the last year, two highlights for me really have been, one, being at the C4SO clergy retreat in early May this year. It was the, the first time for me meeting many of my colleagues in the diocese face to face for the first time. It was a wonderful few days together. I really got to know the heartbeat of many of the clergy uh, that are leading our diocese. Then lately, uh, I've started to gather with uh, Jonathan Kinberg, who's uh, the Diaspora Network Coordinator for C4SO, and Jeremy McNeese, who's uh, Associate Director of New Wineskin Networks and the C4SO representative 
to the Global Mission Initiative, GMI, which is the coordinating body for global missions in our province, to plan, to pray, and to strategize together so that we may help c 4 SO churches and leaders and lay, lay people, all of us, get involved with greater mission opportunities as we look ahead to 2023, join in asking the Spirit to speak to us, helping us and our congregations know how to engage North America and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Over the last year, uh, Next Gen Leadership uh, has helped multiple churches on their journey to hire for the first time or some for the second time, student ministry leaders. We've been working with rectors to help them develop clear job descriptions, uh, to make connections, and even to design their first ever student ministry for that community. It has been such a joy and a gift to get to know several of our C4SO rectors as they're seeing the importance and the necessity and the goodness that comes from watching young people move from not yet followers of Jesus to wholehearted, sold out followers of Jesus and what that does in the life of their whole church and how that gives them a different insight and wisdom into the life of the community that they're in. The Next Gen Leadership Team uh, and Ryder Mills in particular uh, launched Begin, which is a local ch church resource to discuss identity, the theology of work, influence, and innovation. We've offered C4SO specific trainings, such as uh, how do we take our minor protection policy uh, from a policy document into a practice uh, that we can actually create a culture of holistic safety in our student ministries. And our C4SO student ministries, you guys have been great at taking advantage of some of our provincial offerings, such as the Champion Grant. The Champion Grant supports student ministry innovation and mission through a financial gift to say if you have an idea we want to seed that we have finances to help with that in the province and c4so student ministries right now take advantage of that more than any other diocese all of this matters because young people are both the mission field and the first missionaries in it our canon theologians assist Bishop Todd in the task of living out our five key values, kingdom, spirit, formation, mission, and sacrament. Embodying these values keeps C4SO in alignment with God's rule and reign and in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I hope that the diocese gets, um, continues to be confident in the good news um, and the work of what God is doing in and through his people. I think, I think the hardest thing for us to consistently believe in a world that is kind of beset by doubt and cynicism, it's that the message that we have for the world is good news, that brings gospel, that changes their lives. And so I would hope that our congregations and our, and our clergy and our laity would move forward into mission, committed and confident in the good news of, of the gospel that's revealed in the scripture. The other one is I hope you continue to push into um, being a diocese that is uniquely positioned, I think, to combine orthodoxy and orthopraxy, that we that we can hold on to the faith once delivered, the things that are in the creeds and the scriptures, and because we hold to the faith once delivered, we're also a, a community committed to justice and reconciliation. And so I would hope that the diocese in 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025 would be a diocese that combines these two things. But I think that we live in a time where people want to pull these things apart. There's kind of the theology, Bible people on this side and the justice people on that side. And I think that what Todd is trying to model for the diocese that we can get behind is to combine, yes, I believe these things. But my belief about these things, about the scriptures and the great tradition, leads me to have concern for the disinherited. So gospel ministry and justice aren't enemies, but they're friends and they mutually inform one another. And I hope that our diocese keeps that commitment. Uh, hey, C4SO family, JR, Amy, Roscoe here. Uh, if you don't know, we are the co-lead pastors of a historic church, First Church of the Resurrection uh, in Canton, Ohio, where we've been for the last three years. But we also um, last year began sharing a part-time role with C4SO as 
co-directors of Missional Innovation, uh, which is a really fancy title. Um, and where that grew out of was um, we last year at the beginning of 2021, uh, we had been invited and stepped towards something called the Order of the Common Life. And the Order of the Common Life uh, is sort of a neo-monastic religious order um, that's trying to source a rule of life out of the best of the monastic tradition uh, and invite people into exploring what that looks like today. And their vocation they talk about is helping people to notice and nurture the work of God in their lives. And so we stepped towards that through a six month uh, postulancy process uh, and then moved on to a novitiate stage of membership in that order. And we were drawing so much life and so much blessing and had so much imagination for what that kind of a space and that kind of work could do for other people uh, that we approached Bishop Todd uh, and let him know about this and what was going on and said, uh, we would love um, to talk about ways that we can make something like this available to the broader C4SO community. So we're excited that this past year we had a chance to invite uh, several uh, of you uh, to participate with us in our first C4SO uh, group uh, of the Order of the Common Life. And it was wonderful to have people from all over, uh, all different places of ministry. And it was good to be together and experience uh, together what that uh, cohort offers. And we're excited to see where that goes um, in this next year, as we have opportunity for even more people to join in uh, that experience and to see where those that have already gone through that take that in their local uh, churches and ministries. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jin Cho, um, and I'm the leader of the Revelation 7-9 Task Force for Diversity and Inclusion, and we exist to help our diocese become more fully formed by God's kingdom vision for diversity in creation. Um, concretely, our team, we exist to help our churches and clergy navigate matters of race and justice in our world, both within our congregational communities but also within the context of the larger communities of our world that we are called to be a part of. Um, we, it is our conviction that God created us to exist together in diversity in this beautiful vision uh, as revealed by Jesus through his life and teaching where he consistently embraced the other and broke through all sorts of human boundaries and as also revealed by the Holy Spirit in the formation of this multi-ethnic church in Acts 2, and finally also in the eschatological vision of the fulfilled kingdom that is given to us in Revelation 7-9, where we get our namesake. So insofar as this diversity is the vision of the kingdom as given to us by God, the work of our task force is essentially missional to help God's people, our diocese specifically, to live into this vision. Non-anxious, confident missional leadership is grounded in the notion that this is our Father's world. However, we must be aware and ready to serve a world in which people cause harm within the church. C4SO's goal is to protect the most vulnerable among us. It's an important mission because as a church, we have work to do. We have a purpose. We're not just a, a, an institution for the sake of itself, um, but an institution with work to do in God's plan. And so in order to, uh, to be effective, we have to have strong relationships and um, we have to be closely knit together. And the only way to be able to do that is if we're safe. If we can be vulnerable, if we can be humble together, if we can journey together, and this is the only way that we can have the relationships that allow us to work effectively. Even though we face sin and tragedy on earth, one day Jesus will hand over the kingdom to his Father and everything will be perfect. This means that the church in all its cultural context can cultivate habits of heart from which we love extravagantly, take joyful risks, and forgive generously. As missional leaders, we joyfully welcome the nations God is bringing to our doorstep. My name is Jonathan Kinberg, and I am the Diaspora Mobilizer with uh, C4SO, with the Diaspora Network. 
Um, we just had our first launch conference uh, two, several weeks ago, the beginning of October, October 7 and 8 here in Austin, Texas. And it was a beautiful picture of the nations here in the United States gathered together uh, on mission and in worship. Uh, we began with a um, what we called the Nations Worship Night, which uh, featured immigrant pastors, immigrant churches and leaders, uh, particularly from the Austin area, uh, coming together for a multilingual gathering. We, it's the first time that something like this, as far as I know, happened in Austin. And we uh, worshiped in, I think, re between reading scripture and praying and worshiping through song and dance, probably in 15 or 16 different languages. Um, it was a small snapshot, really, of what's happening around the country in most major cities in the U.S. that um, are rapidly growing through the presence of immigrants from around the world. Um, one of the things that um, stood out from Diaspora Conference is, and one of the things that we're hoping to see throughout C4SO is really seeing immigrants themselves as the uh, center and as really the uh, agents of mission uh, within the U.S. And so for a long time, the United States has sent missionaries to around the world. But what does it mean now to be receiving Christian immigrants from all over the world? And what is it like to, in that sense, be uh, receivers of mission and really then uh, strengthen and partner uh, immigrants in their mission here? At C4SO, we want to be a part of this move and, and really come around, encourage, support, equip, mobilize immigrant pastors and churches as they are here in cities like San Jose, like Atlanta, like um, Austin, like Houston, uh, Many of the places our C4SO churches are that are rapidly becoming immigrant majority cities and where the church also is rapidly becoming an uh, immigrant majority um, community.